Attention! By decree of the Lord of Holy Terror and by extension the God Emperor of Mankind, queries into the recorded archives who are requested are strictly prohibited. By requiring such information of a prohibited nature is tantamount to heresy. As an act to such, it is an account of the The God Emperor's decree and edict, you are thusly a heretic. As a convicted heretic, you are in violation of the following. Article 1073P, Act 977864-211. Slash slash. Every single one of us landed with our weapons firing. There was seven or eight Tarmogots keeping the Xanthro company and only one of them was still alive when we hit the ground. Sarge finished that one off and we all fanned out towards our assigned areas. We moved fast, motivated by our desires to get to our choke points to set up before reinforcements arrived and then get something subtle between us and Gravis fight with the Xanthrope. Honestly, we hadn't taken the Space Marine too seriously up to that point. I mean, we respected him and found him daunting as hell, but his combat performance when that last drop hadn't been up to the stories you hear about Space Marines. His fight with the uh, Terranid Psyker, though, that was something to tell the grandkids about. In a few seconds, we saw him fighting before we got under cover. Sergeant Gravis baited out and dodged three massive lightning bolts, scored twice as many hits on the Xenos' shield bubble, and generally moved with more speed and grace than should have been possible. Abstractly, we'd known that the Emperor's Scythe chapter were the best experts available when it came to fighting Tyranids, but watching Gravis play that Xanthrope like a fiddle really drove it home. We all would have stopped to spectate if the Xanthros misses weren't blowing rocks near us into red-hot shrapnels, that is. Anyways, we all got the hell off that hilltop and into position. Spot stayed up high and gave us a good view of the incoming reinforcements as we set up our mines and found the best lines of fire. We all finished our preparations just in time and started mowing down the first wave of Tyranids as they climbed the hill. The first wave was nothing but gaunts, both varieties, that have been near the hill. Thanks to the wonderful nature of choke points, not to mention good firing positions and techno heretically awesome weapons, we were able to kill them all before they managed to shoot or claw us. That's not to say that we actually killed all the Tyranids, Nids don't tend to run out of bodies to throw out a problem, but we did convince them to rethink their strategy. Once the choke points were too well choked with bodies of anyone to get past, the Gaunts broke off and waited for heavier reinforcements. Now, we'd been in this sort of fight with Nids before. Back when we were actually in the guards, we fought a memorable and debatably successful defensive battle against the Bugs. So, we knew that it would almost certainly come next. Warriors, possibly the Ravager or Gargoyle support. On our respective side of the hill, Amy, Nubby, and Tink all moved to elevated positions and helped Spot watch the higher life forms. Meanwhile, those of us still on the ground made sure that the mines in our next positions were ready, and Sarge checked with Gravis and his scout. The Marines were still working on wearing down the Xanthrope's shields without killing it and asked us not to distract them again. We all made some rather unkind comments on that last part, but refrained from transmitting any of them. Spot, the Wonder Drone, tagged the second wave on its way in, and as we'd guessed, there were some warriors directing the charge from behind an initial meat shield. The guard had a standard combat doctrine for pretty much every situation. While most of these are not very individual guardsmen friendly, the one for that sort of attack is a good one. So, for once, we did it by the book. Admittedly, said book is rather short, but just means it's easier to remember. The three of us had moved up into sniper positions, held our fires, and prepared to shoot the big one first. On Doc and Tink's flank, an overcharged Tau laser thingy guided plasma bolt turned their warrior into chunky salsa. 
Over on Amy and Twitches, a precision headshot from our actually quite talented markswoman took out theirs. With the synapse creatures dead, the gaunts lost cohesion, and both pairs of guardsmen easily mowed them down. Unfortunately, the sniper on the third flank was Nubby, who didn't have Tink's anti-armor weapon or Amy's accuracy. A very angry, if not rather burnt and bloody, Tyranid warrior immediately returned fire with one of those big bee gun things, pinning Nubby down on his sniper perch. Sarge tried to hold off the incoming wave himself, making heavy use of his grenades and the choke point, but it quickly became apparent that it wasn't going to work. Sarge calmed the rest of us and over Nubby's shrills and screaming, asked if anyone could give him support before he had to blow his minds and relocate. The rest of us were still rather busy with our mop-ups, and reinforcing Sarge meant crossing the xanthrope-infested hilltop, so we all declined. It seemed like Sarge was going to have to give up his flank safety margin, and he was getting to ready to blow his minds and pull Nubby out when the scout marine told him to hold a little longer. Sarge managed it. He wound up having to use his boots to keep an especially persistent gaunt off while he reloaded, and his armor and beefiness barely saved him from a few flesh borer hits, but he managed it. Right as things were getting downright dire, the warrior and several nearby gaunts went down an amazing display of precision shooting. Nubby finally got his ass out of cover and helped Sarge turn the tide back around as the scout returned to the Xanthrope fight. Things were looking pretty good, even if we could see the third wave mustering near the bottom of the hill. Good changed to great when we heard Gravis and the Xanthrope shield was almost down. And then... everything went to shit. Looking back, it's not that hard to spot the exact moment when the shitting of everything occurred. Actually, it's not that hard to spot it at the time either. Within 20 seconds of it happening, we knew what had gone wrong and why. But it took a bit longer for all the horrible results of that one screw up to manifest. Anyways, what had started the whole horrible shit show was a simple communications failure at a rather hectic moment. The third wave of Tyranids was coming in, and we were busy shooting them and getting ready to blow our minds and fall back. Up on top of the hill, Sergeant Gravis had the Xanthrope on the ropes and was ordering his scout to get ready to trinket. The scout marine had just returned from helping Sarge and was perched on top of the pointy pillar of the top of the hill. As the scout got the trink ready and lined up for what must have been a rather tricky shot, he spotted something and calmed us. His exact words were, Interrogator. Incoming Terranid Assault Flyer. North side. Now, let's do an experiment. First, go out and find 50,000 guardsmen. Actually, go out and get 100. It's not like guardsmen are hard to find. Hell, we're literally the largest organized fighting force in the galaxy. Which, come to think of it, means that the definition of a standard response to anything is what we do, not what a few bloody crazy stomping around in power armor getting eaten by bugs at... <sighs> Anyways, ask any of these guardsmen what they'll do when someone warns them a hostile air unit's incoming. Nothing else, no details or orders, just hostile air incoming. You know what they'll say? It's the same regardless of regiment, specialization, rank, or anything. Every single one of them will tell you the same thing. They will get the hell into cover. Apparently the Emperor-sized chapter of the Space Marines aren't on the same page as the rest of us though. Or at least that Scout Marine wasn't. I mean, if he'd just been a little more clear. If he just added a few more bloody words like, take it out, or cover me, or even if he just shortened it to, incoming assault, we would have understood. But no, 
He told us there was a flyer incoming and stood there with his ass hanging out wrongly believing that we'd shoot it down while he lined up the shot on the Xanthrope. Nubby was the first one to notice the impending disaster. Well, actually, he just saw the scout standing there and told Sarge that the stupid bastard was gonna get his ass show off. Sarge stared for a second, then peeked out of the cover and saw what sort of flyer was incoming. Everything started to click together. The incoming Terranid wasn't some dedicated air bioform designed to strafe or bomb ground targets. It was the biggest, meanest melee monstrosity in the swarm or at least the biggest one that was still capable of flight. It was a flyerant, a winged hide tyrant, the Tyranid equivalent of a Lord General crossed with a main battle tank and some wings strapped on for good measure. It was big, pissed, and coming right at the only member of our team that was standing out in the open. Unfortunately, Sarge was a little too late. By the time he started shouting his warning, nearly five tons of flying Terran had hit the scout marine in the back. You know how in cartoons a bus or train hitting someone and they'll just sort of vanish? It was exactly like that, right down to how the poor bastard's sniper rifle was left pinwheeling in the air for a second. In the aftermath, three things became apparent. The scout had not gotten his shot off, the physically exhausted Xanthrope was doing a runner, and Gravis had bigger problems than chasing it. The Space Marine told us that the Xanthrope was fleeing towards Sarge, asked us to catch it, and started shouting about some place called Sotha. A second later, the Tyrant let out a scream and shook the entire hilltop. The situation was bad, but it was also, thank the Emperor, relatively simple. We had a perimeter to maintain, a hive tyrant to survive, and a xanthrope to catch. Sarge started bellowing out orders, and the rest of us scrambled to follow them. Since we still had all our minds in place, the perimeter was actually the least pressing issue. Sarge's first order was to fall back towards the top of the hill and let the explosives hold off the smaller tyranids for a while. Sarge then told us he was going after the Xanthrope and sent Nubby to get the scout's trink-loaded sniper rifle. For the rest of us, Sarge's final orders were a little more... Uh, freeform. Tink was to get his drone on the Hive Tyrant, and the rest of us were told to quote-unquote handle it. Seriously, that was his entire master plan. By the Emperor, there's a bloody Hive Tyrant inside our perimeter. It's killed one space marine, and as soon as it's finished off the other, it's gonna kill us all. What should we do, sir? Handle it. He never managed to live that one down. The ridiculousness of that order aside, it's not like we actually needed one. Each of us knew that the only way we'd live through this is if the tyrant was dead, forced to retreat, or kept distracted long enough for us to call in and board the shuttle. All three of these possible solutions could be accomplished in the same way, by shooting the big bug and running away if it chased us. Some variations and improv could be thrown in as things progress, but shoot and run was really the core strategy. Even the Space Marine was doing it, though it was more stab and run in his case. The first of us to actually see the Hive Tyrant up close were Amy and Twitch. As they ran up towards the hilltop, Sergeant Gravis started coming down in these big, graceful leaps made possible by his grav shoot. Valiant heroes of the Imperium, both of them were, they immediately scrambled to find hiding places. As the massive Terranid charged down after Gravis, both of them held their fire, not to mention their breaths, and observed what they could. The flyer was, of course, a winged bipedal bug that stood six meters tall and was made of distilled murder and hate, but it had a few important distinguishing points. It had four arms. Well, three-ish, after Gravis had gotten its attention. The top of one and a half ended in the usual Tyranid talons. The bottom pair held a massive bone sword and one of those freaky sentient whip things. Each of these weapons was capable of messily killing any poor guardsman that got in close, 
but none of them had any real range. That was very good thing for us, not so much for Gravis though. Speaking of Sergeant Gravis, he was coming down the hill fast, but the flyer was gaining on him and he didn't have much room left to run before he hit Twitch's and Amy's minefield. Right as it looked like he was going to try to jump over it and then wade through the incoming wave of nids, he suddenly reversed direction. All three of the Flyerant's attacks missed the Space Marine as, with more speed and agility than anyone wearing the equivalent of a light tank should have, he dodged between the beast's legs. It was impressive as hell, especially the part where he got a whack in with his power sword on his way through. Both Amy and Twitch watched appreciatively, until they realized the Flyerant wasn't going to be able to stop. The 4.9-ton Tyranid flailing its wings in a mad attempt to get airborne completely failed to do so, and plowed right through a dozen AP mines. Twitch and Amy barely made it into new cover in time. Of course, it takes more than a few AP mines to kill a Hive Tyrant. Aside from shredding its wings, all they really seem to do is just piss it off. The tyrant let out another of its piercing shrieks in reverse directions. It started pleading back up the hill after Gravis. Twitch and Amy watched it go, then realized they had a bit of a problem. Namely that there was no longer much of a minefield between them and the waves of smaller tyranids. The debate over what to do consisted of Amy and Twitch pointing in opposite directions and yelling, handle it, at each other, then splitting up. Twitch ran around dropping the last of his mines and spraying fire at the incoming gaunts. Amy ran up the hill after Gravis and the flyerant, hit firing her pulse rifle as a massive target until it crested the hill and she lost line of sight. When Amy reached the top of the hill, she found Sergeant Gravis carefully circling around the enraged flyerant while Doc and Tink shot it. Like the other two guardsmen, she sighted the towel marker thingy spot was projecting on the tyrant and poured as much fire in as she could. It was beginning to look like the three of them would be able to wear the creature down. But then, Gravis botched one of his dodges. The Space Marine had to choose between trying to block the Flyerant's bone sword or dying a horrible death, and reluctantly chose the former. For the second time that day, he flew through the air with all the grace and aerodynamics of a thrown brick. Sergeant Gravis ricocheted off of some sewn spires encircling the hilltop, briefly tunneling upwards, then crashing into the dirt directly behind Doc and Tink. He was a tough bastard though. Within a few seconds of his landing, started moving again. Both the Space Marine and his armor groaned as he struggled to get back on his feet. The Flyrant let out another roar, sighted on the recovering Space Marine and charged. Now, in your normal commissariat approved uplifting story of heroism, this is where the two stalwart guardsmen would have stood their ground and laid down their lives to buy the wounded Space Marine time to recover. Then, right after the guardsmen had finished valiantly sacrificing themselves, he would have magically gotten better and killed the vile Xenos. Oh, and then all the orcs and Terranids on the planet would have died, and the whole place would have turned into a garden world that paid its tithes on time, and there would be statues of heroic dead guardsmen everywhere. Ugh. The warp take those stories and whoever keeps writing them, and the whole commissary for that matter. Ever notice how it's always some guardsman and never the commissar who dies horribly in the Emperor's name? Anyways, Doc and Tink took one good look at the charging flyerant and ran for it. Okay, I realize that sounds bad, but it's not like they ran down the hill to left Gravis to die. They kept firing and ran perpendicularly along the top of the hill in, and I quote the official report here, an attempt to draw the Hive Tyrant's attention away from its target. Anyways, it's not like they would have accomplished anything by standing there, and there is no way either of them could have carried a fully armored Space Marine to safety. 
My point is, what happened next was not Doc, Tink's, or anyone else's fault, and I'll have you know that a tribunal of Sino Orno Xenos Inquisitors who reviewed Spot's footage agreed with that assessment. Well, well, two-thirds of the tribunal anyway. So, while three of us poured a hell of a lot of plasma into the flyrant, it closed to melee range with Sergeant Gravis. He parried the beast's whip thing, sidestep a strike from the single remaining talon, and then did that trick where he dodged through its legs again. Whereupon the flyrant turn, brought its bone sword in mid-chest level, and cut Sergeant Gravis in half. Twitch finished laying his replacement minefield and arrived at the hilltop right then, as did Sarge and Nubby who were lugging the tranquilized Xanthrope between them. Their part of what could be generously called the plan hadn't involved anything as terrifying as a flarent, but it hadn't been a cakewalk either. Sarge had managed to sight the fleeing Xanthrope as it came down the hill towards him. It turned out that even when too exhausted to keep itself hovering, the Psyker bug is capable of wriggling along the ground at surprisingly high speeds. While Nubby hunted down the scout's drop rifle and trink round, Sarge chased the Xanthrope back and forth between the rocks, dodging the occasional weak lightning bolt and stray flesh bore around as he did so. Eventually, he cornered the beastie between two spires, right as Nummy arrived with the comically oversized Astartes patterned sniper rifle. Since it quickly became apparent that Nubby was completely incapable of aiming the oversized rifle, and the Xanthrope was still squirming around a lot, Sarge decided to take the shot himself. The second he was distracted, the bug tried to escape again, and Sarge wound up tackling the thing and trying to pin it to the ground. It was like wrestling a cross between a greased pig, a giant snake, and an uninsulated power conduit. In the end, he collected a few scratches, a nasty bite wound, and a whole lot of electrical burns before Nubby just dragged the rifle over and jammed it into the Xanthrope's underbelly. Then they hauled the surprisingly long and heavy Xenos up the hilltop, pausing to chuck a few grenades at the incoming wave of mid reinforcements on the way, and got there just in time to see Gravis's bisection. There was a brief silence, which was punctuated by two meaty thumbs and Nubby's nasally voice, Holy shit, think he's gonna be okay? Then the flyer roared again and all six of us opened fire. Spa was projecting its tau laser thingy in the middle of the Flyron's torso, and we all just sighted our weapons in on it and held the triggers down. Looking back, it's hard to say whether it was sheer weight of fire, or if the big bastard was just running out of energy. But its charge towards us was much slower than its earlier one had been. Every single one of us had just got an entire magazine's worth of shots out before the Flyron was a third of the way to Sergeant Nubby. It never made it to two-thirds. There was a sort of squelchy pop, and its torso's armor gave away, and the beast stumbled. It sort of huddled there, trying to protect its wounded chest, and sending out a screech that was echoed by the smaller Terranids climbing the hill. From the sounds of it, they were finally getting past our minefield and would be arriving in seconds. None of us went to hold off the incoming reinforcements, though. The flyer was the very definition of uh, the big one, and we were going to shoot it first. Spot redirected its marking to the Xenos' head. Not that we actually needed the fancy Tau flashlight, though. Even if the flyer's head was a relatively small target, it was a stationary one now. Every shot we fired hit, and within seconds, our massed plasma fire either punched through the Tyranid's head armor or cooked the thing's brains to boiling point. Its head exploded in a particularly disgusting grenade, and a psychic pressure that none of us had ever noticed was released. All around the hilltop, the incoming Terranids broke and fled as quickly as they could, and the Xanthrope twitched a little when Sergeant Nubby had dropped it. Let me tell you, we'd escaped certain death before, but the relief we felt on that barren hilltop was the greatest of our lives. Every one of us just stood there and basked in the sheer joy of still being alive. Then, Tank spoiled it by asking if Garvis had called the shuttle in before he died.
Tink's question was followed by the sound of a few thousand orc wagging, and it occurred that we'd probably just killed the creature that had been holding the Tyranid defense of these hills together. I doubt anyone in the history of the Imperium has ever gone from ecstatic relief to blind panic as quickly as we did. Sarge started wildly flipping through the comms channel, Twitch ran around deploying the last of his explosives, Amy screamed at Tink for not remembering sooner, and Tink called Amy a skunk-haired super bitch. The odd men out were Doc, who had gone right past panic to depression, and Nubby, who defaulted to some very basic instincts when overwhelmed. While everyone else was busy screaming, shouting, mining, and crying, Nubby went to get himself a shiny, not quite new, power sword. The cretinous little vulture found the sword still in Gravis's hand, and which didn't deter him even slightly. He firmly planted a boot on the marine's arm and started prying at the power-armored fist. As Nubby levered off the smallest of the marine's fingers, two particularly reflective actions occurred. First, Gravis shook Nubby's grip off and tightened his fingers on his power sword. Secondly, Nubby automatically responded by drawing his combat knife and preparing to give the Emperor's peace, thereby settling any silly little ownership dispute. It was immensely lucky for all of us that Gravis' ceramite helmet was still sealed since it made trying to slit his throat a long and noisy process. Doc noticed Nubby going at the Space Marine's armored neck like an incompetent lumberjack, realized what it implied, and body checked Nubby off the not quite dead Sergeant Gravis. Our brilliant medic then stood there with his med kit open, panicking, trying to figure out how to treat the mother of all chest wounds. The commotion caught Sarge's attention in turn, and he abandoned his fruitless attempts to contact the shuttle by randomly trying comm channels. Sarge's first question wasn't if Doc was sure Gravis was still alive or how that was even possible, it was whether the Space Marine was capable of calling for evac. Doc gibbered and pointed out that Gravis' lungs had been cut in half and he could actually see inside them. Sarge took that as a no, but noticed Nubby's knife stuck between Gravis' helmet and Gorget. Without waiting for a medical option, he seized the knife and twisted it with all his beefy non-com strength. Later, it was explained to Sarge, but not Nubby, that the latches of the Mark VII Power Armor helmet doesn't actually lock. He could have just flipped them open. At the time, though, Sarge was too busy to waste time thinking and just tore apart several million thrones worth of data relays and void seals. When the helmet finally came off with a tear and a snap rather than a little pop, Sarge ran over where Amy was beating all kinds of shit at a tank. He ended their friendly little argument over who the quote-unquote the real bitch was by grabbing the back of Amy's orc-stained armor and unceremoniously chucked her into Twitch's direction. Sarge then dragged Tink to his feet, thrust Gravis' helmet into the techie's hands, and screamed at him to make the Vox work. Tink stared at the helmet for a second, realized he had absolutely no idea how it worked, and wisely decided to try the obvious thing first, which is to say, he put the helmet on his head and hesitantly asked if the thing was on. He was nearly deafened by the shuttle pilot's screaming request to know what the hell was going on and what had happened to Sergeant Gravis. Tink decided that Sarge should answer that question, handed the helmet over to him with a smug little line about being able to fix anything, and went to see if Doc had anything for a broken nose. He immediately regretted that decision. So, Sarge was wearing the helmet and explaining things to the shuttle pilot, Twitch was being Twitch, and since it looked like we actually wouldn't be left stranded in the middle of an army of orcs, both Nubby and Amy decided it was time to take a breather. They sat on the tranquilized xanthrope and shared a pack of hilo sticks, and enjoyed the sight of Doc freaking the hell out and shaking Tink like a terrier with a rat. Oh my god, what do I do? I don't know. Do fix something. Stop shaking me. How, Tink? How do you fix being cut in half? We shouldn't even be alive. I don't know what's going on here. I don't know how space marines work. If I 
touch him will stop working? What do I do? I don't... Do the Space Marine thing. What thing? Officer's Jane Seed. His what now? His Jane Seed. It's like the seed thing that Space Marines have. If you pull it up before the Space Marine dies, you can plant it in a servitor and he'll grow back from it. R really? Yeah, they have this whole thing in the last season of Brother Captain Marcus and the corporate film battle. And then the Fire Warrior rescued the team to... Wait, you mean your Talvids? You're basing this off of heretical cartoons? They're not cartoons, they're not heretical. Do you have anything better? Shit, 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 shit. Okay, what's this Gene Seed look like and where does he keep it? Um, I had the sense of that part when they cut out. Uh, I think it's a second heart thingy. It was all green and stuff. Heart thing. So, like in the chest? Yeah, right in the middle. Okay, in the chest. Upper or lower chest? Um, upper or lower chest. If I'm going to be digging around inside looking for something green, I at least need to know which end to dig around in. I don't know. Why don't you go check on the scout? The scout marine was pinned to the hilltop a few dozen meters away where he'd been pierced when the flyerant hit him. I'm using pinned quite literally here. He was face down with a tear in a talon the size of a beefy telephone pole through his back. The talon ended at a very neat cut which matched the stump of the flyerant which had probably explained how Gravis had gotten his attention. Unlike Gravis, there wasn't much confusion over whether the scout was dead. He'd started to go runny. It's not like all of him was melting. Just a sort of explaining around the area where he'd been pierced. Said area included both the upper and lower chest, though. In the name of medical science, Doc poked the mushy corpse with a probe, then jumped backwards with a girly shout when it started to hiss and melt, too. Emperor, I swear he wasn't doing that earlier. Is this like a space marine thing? Do they melt when they die? Ew, I don't think so. Would that, uh, ought to be reusing the armor? Bet you that's a nid thing. Does your big old book of pseudoscience medical bullshit have a section on tearing and bioweapons? Uh, um. Um. Tearing it. Tyrant. Uh. Uh, bone sword. Scything. Talon. <gasps> toxin sacks. Oh, neat. What does it say? If. Full stock field hospital, laboratorium, quarantine, here. Battlefield instructions. Smear area with counterseptics, administer oral detox, scan and apply indicated toxin wands, give plasma, pray to the emperor. I can do all those things. Wait, like plasma from a gun or a bag? And what about the jade same thing though? Screw you, Gene Seed. I can keep him from melting until the shuttle arrives. We can ask the pilot. Now take these and go to his bottom half. These are pills, Doc. How do I give a pair of legs pills? How do you think? Oh, God. I'm not qualified for this. No, well, neither am I. Now do it. Doc's panicked medical treatment were of rather dubious usefulness, especially the part where he fed detox tab to the nearly dead space marine. That stuff is nearly enough to kill you on its own, and it made the big guy flail around and spurt some nasty stuff out the end of his torso, which at least it proved he was alive despite the whole not really breathing thing. Also, Doc put up more fluids back in and sealed off most of the leaky exposed torso area, so it was probably a net gain for Gravis. We all watched him running around yelling at Tink who was stuck with the literal ass end of the job while the sound of incoming orcs grew steadily louder. They came to an immense relief when the shuttle dropped out of the clouds and you better believe we were lined up ready to board before it hit the ground. The pilot wasn't exactly on the same page as the rest of us though. He didn't stay in his seat and kept the engine spun up. Instead, he was standing at the rear hatch when it opened. None of us had actually seen the pilot on our flight in, and that first meeting was rather unpleasant. He was a scout marine and looked nearly identical to the other guy, except for the not being impelled and dissolving. He was also considerably worse at the whole stoicism thing. 
The pilot stood in our way and demanded to know what had happened to Sergeant Gravis and Robram, which is sort of awkward since none of us actually bothered to learn the dead scout marine's name. Anyways, the pilot didn't take his sergeant's bisection well and nearly went berserk when he saw his buddy's rifle sticking out of Nubby's pack. Our outermost minds were going off at this point and none of us wanted to die on the landing pad, so Sarge acted rather cruelly. He yanked the legal man salvage out of Nubby's pack, thrust it into the pilot's arm, and said the scout wanted him to have it, then pointed out that his boss was going to die if we don't take off right now. We didn't have any problem securing the Xanthrope for takeoff. The snaky Xenos was still completely out of it and fit right into one of the oversized seats. Gravis was a bit of a problem though. Doc wound up strapping him upside down in one of the seats, supposedly because it let him tighten the crash harness and would keep everything from falling out if the bandages gave away. None of us knew enough to argue, so he went with the same gross end-up theory for his lower half, which was put in the seat next to him. During the strap-in process, Gravis' sword, bolter, and other little weapons and gadgets disappeared into Nubby's pack back. Thankfully, the pilot was too busy taking off and dodging small arms fire for the incoming orcs to see any of this. After we were out of the orcs' range, our ascent out of the atmosphere went comfortably enough. Sarge sat in relative peacefulness and inspected us troops. In addition to his ample supply of lacerations and electrical burns, we collected a concussion, a fairly nasty leg wound, a broken nose, some cracked ribs, nearly a dozen minor flesh borer hits, and an orc juice marinade. We were all still alive though, and we had Oak Xanthrope too, so all in all, we called it a win. Sure, our space marine had taken one hell of a beating, but we completed our objectives and horrible sacrifices in the name of victory are what space marines are all about. I mean, we'd been attacked by a bloody hive tyrant, and two marines for a tyrant is a pretty good trade. Anyways, it was beginning to look like Gravis might just survive long enough to get him to a real Medicaid. So, yeah, totally a win. We were in the middle of congratulating ourselves and speculating on if Gravis would be put into a dreadnought when three things happened. First, the Xanthrope started twitching. Then, Gravis' armor started beeping and his lower half began to smoke. And finally, the helmet in Sarge's lap started talking. So, no shit they we were. Sneaking across a war zone with a slowly awakening Tyranid Psyker and a quickly dying Space Marine, when Sergeant Rebus called for his evac. If you actually needed proof that the entire purpose of the universe is to shit on poor, hard-working guardsmen, it'd be damn hard to find something better than that timing right there. I mean, just to remind you, this wasn't some simple pickup from a combat zone he needed. No, 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 no. He needed us to sneak back into boarding range of a Tyranid Hive ship, which was still being assaulted by a few million orc fighters, to pick him up before a high-yield vortex bomb he just planted went off. You could say that we weren't the ones doing the actual sneaking, and that we'd been safely through it before, without the armed vortex bomb, of course. But this time, it would have been a race against the Xanthro waking up and Sergeant Gravis melting. Every man has their limit, and this was well beyond ours. Before the pilot could respond, Sergeant put on Gravis' helmet and calmly, clearly told the Space Marine to wait his damn turn. All of us, except for Doc, who was rather busy, cheered. Sergeant Rebus and the pilot were less enthusiastic. The argument that followed included accusations of cowardice. The pilot coming out of the cockpit with a bolter and threatening to kill either us or the Xanthrope, and Sarge telling one of the Emperor's angels of death to shut up and soldier, soldier. In the end, a combination of devotion to the mission and desire to save his sergeant won the pilot to our side. 
Sergeant Rebos was instructed to delay the bomb's detonation and hold out until we were dropped off and the return trip could be made. The conversation ended with Rebus bitterly complaining that dying waiting for evac was an end worthy of a guardsman. Sarge responded by telling him that holding the line wasn't that hard. After all, us guardsmen did it all the time. Now, it sounds like we callously doomed a team of valiant space marines to their death, but we really weren't delaying their extraction that long. The Marines had prepared for this type of situation when they had adjusted their mission plan to account for only having one shuttle. The Accords Border had followed our stealthy little vessel into the system as quietly as it could and was now close enough that it'd be a matter of minutes, not hours, to reach it. Of course, being that close meant that there was a significant risk of detection and the Accords Border did not have any real way to hold off an attack by the Orcs or the Nids. Back at the briefing, Rebus had claimed it was an acceptable risk slow, which goes to show you what a tactical bloody genius they was. Okay, that's a little unfair. Having the ship closer turned out to be very good for him. It's not like he could have foreseen that we'd capture the Xanthrope, but forget to bring along a second dose of that special sight tranquil stuff. Though if he's spared the blame, then that means Gravis and his scout deserve a little for not taking the excessively simple precautions of leaving a few spare doses in the shuttle. I mean, we're going into extremely hostile territory. Why was the scout carrying all the tranks? And why hadn't either of them told us a second dose would be needed? Is Taranid wrangling some super secret Emperor Sice only technique? Or did they think that there was no way we survive and continue the mission if they didn't? Well, actually, that one is completely understandable. Arrogant as hell, but understandable. I'm getting ahead of myself, though. The Xanthrope was a later problem. At the time, our big concern was that half of Gravis was dying and the other half was violently decomposing. Once again, the task was divided between Doc and Tink. This time, Doc was much calmer, and his response was surprisingly reasonable and professional. He fussed around the upside-down space marine torso with his medical scanner and tox wands, and shouted questions about a sturdy biology and power armor automated Medicaid systems at the pilot. And there was some rather confusing talk about illicit kidneys, biomedical cogitators, and cellular regeneration reservoirs, which to the rest of us ignored because Tank's part of the job was a complete shit show. Whatever was on the Flyron's sword, well, when it got going, it really got going. Gravis' lower half went from fine to melting from the wound down in mere seconds. It's hard to say whether Tank's response was best or worst one available, but it was certainly the most disgusting. In an effort to slow down the process, he unbuckled the power armored legs and flipped them upside down. The smoldering bandage immediately gave way and dumped a horrible combination of meat juice, xenotoxins, and extremely powerful acid onto the seat. The smell was beyond vile, and all of us had to put on our rebreathers just to stay conscious, which was lucky considering how many airborne toxins were found in the shuttle after we landed. So, after the spillage started dissolving the seat, the rest of us became very interested in helping Tink. Of course, none of us knew Jack about biochemistry, so we were able to offer what might be called mechanical solutions to the acid problems, and most of those suggestions were absolutely terrible. In the end, we settled with the traditional current border technique of shoving out the airlock and hoping it needed oxygen and heat to keep doing whatever. So that's why when we finally docked with the occurrence border, our shuttle's hull was decorated by a pair of legs being gripped by Spot, the Wonder Drone. It says something that none of the people waiting in the bay even commented on that. The occurrence border had been warned of the time-sensitive nature of our cargo and the welcoming party was well prepared. Doc's hospitaler girlfriend and her minions were ready with a bunch of scary looking medical gear and a sort of big goo filled container. Gravis' legs and 
To Dink's horror, Spot were immediately pried off the hull, crammed into said giant pickle jar, and hauled off before we made it out of the shuttle. Doc was the first down the ramp. With Tink's help, he deposited Gravs on the waiting gurney and then turned to his girlfriend and went for a hug and a kiss. He didn't get either. Instead, she screamed at him to get his rebreather on, hosed him with chemical sprayer, and then ordered him to go through a full decontamination and meet her in the med bay. Doc just stood there, dripped for a second, and then dejectedly jogged after his departing girlfriend. Those of us who weren't struggling to get the Xanthrope out of the shuttle chuckled at this. Well, at least until a pair of sprayed armed minion started hosing us down as well. We'd all been thoroughly soaked by the time we got the Xanthrope out of the seat and loaded onto the cargo trolley Hannah had been waiting for us. The sprayer then moved on to hosing the shuttle's interior, but before they could get much done, the rear hatch slammed shut and the engines kicked back on. In clear violation of all safety procedures, the pilot had rocketed out of the bay before we'd clear the area. As he left, the pilot calmed us and promised vengeance if Gravis didn't survive. And from the helmet Sarge was still carrying, he overheard him giving the ETA to Sergeant Rebus. We silently wished him luck and turned to the serious business of getting our Xanthrope stored in the Psyker containment cells. The Xanthrope hadn't been any trouble during the uploading process. That's because it'd come almost fully awake while we were still 10 minutes out, and we had to do something about it. Initially, we'd hoped that this far away from the Tyranids and the Hive ship, it'd revert to being a dumb beast. Acting on this theory, when the Xanthrope started clawing at its straps and manifesting small bolts of electricity, Sarge attempted to establish superiority by punching it in the snout. That did not work. Plan B was to hit it with one of the guard-issued tranks and painkiller serrets from Doc's kit. It's not like he was using it anyways. When that didn't work, we went with plan C, which was to keep applying plans A and B until they did work. After a fair amount of punching and enough tranks to kill three men, the uppity Xeno Psyker finally went back to sleep. Disturbingly, though, the shuttle was still filled with little snips of static, and we all felt a sort of ominous pressure in the air. We tried to call the xenologist at it back on the ship and get his opinion on that, but our comms had a surprising amount of trouble, so we settled on asking him to meet us in the bay. The attic was waiting next to Hana as we uploaded the xanthrope onto the pallet. He took note of the minor phenomena as well as the empty serrets that we'd left sticking in the Xenos. After processing this for a second, he began yelling at us to go faster, which was immensely unhelpful, since we were all outrunning him until he got onto the pallet himself. The part where he called ahead to warn the Psyker cells and asked Bumble to meet us halfway was much more useful though, so we forgave him. Picture this if you will a cargo pallet racing down the corridors of a spaceship. It is occupied by a large, unconscious Xenos that looks like a cross between a snake and a fetus, a slightly overweight man in robes, and a guardsman with an injured leg. The guardsman is holding a wrench that is connected to a random tangle of wires which has been hung over the Xenos. As the pallet races along, he is using the wrench to ground increasingly large bursts of inexplicably green electricity against the floor and walls. Behind the pallet are a terrified looking tech priest, a burly guardsman who looked like he'd recently crawled through a burning razor blade factory, and both of them are pushing said pallet as fast as they can through the maze-like series of quarters that make up the ship. Every twist and turn requires a frantic effort to change the heavy palace direction and occasionally one of the pushers will misjudge, slam into the wall or doorframe, and then have to scramble to catch back up. A fair distance ahead of the pallet are two guardsmen. One is wiry and wreathed in explosives, and the other is short and lugging a backpack packed near to bursting. They are screaming at people to get out of the corridors, applying indiscriminate force when necessary, and opening various doors and hatches the pallet needs to go through. 
a little behind them is a guardswoman who could be defined as regal looking if she wasn't completely filth encrusted. She is pausing at corners and relaying upcoming direction changes to the pallet pushers. So this parade of panic, it made its way through the nearly half a kilometer of the ship corridor, trailing confusion and technical failures behind it. But it really didn't get that bad until right at the halfway point, when Fumbles suddenly stepped out of the side hatch and into the path of the unrushing pallet. A second later, he was face down on top of the xanthrope, scratching his badly bruised shins and screaming to the top of his lungs. Not being a sniker, I can't really say what Fumbles did during that mad scramble. From our perspective, he just sort of laid there and gibbered, and later on he claimed he couldn't remember any of it. He was probably doing something really important, like keeping the Xanthrope from doing stuff while it was unconscious, or hiding us from the hive mind. Chances are that without him doing his thing, we would have died horribly before we got to the holding cells. We didn't really appreciate that at the time, though. All we noticed was how immensely inconvenient Fumbles made the rest of our journey. After Fumbles arrived, in addition to the electricity thrown off by the sleeping Xanthrope, we had to deal with freak indoor snowstorms, a few instances of spontaneous gravity reversals, and all sorts of creepy noises and visions. On two occasions, the effects were so bad that Sarge considered dumping the accident-prone Psyker off the pallet and leaving him behind, but the Xenologist Adept insisted that he stay. Luckily, Hannah's augmentics didn't take long to start working again after they spontaneously locked up, and the minor demon only made three steps before the combination of a pulse rifle and what might be called a power wrench turned it into chunky salsa. Despite all the complications, we made incredibly good time on our mad sprint, covering like a kilometer or just under six minutes. It wasn't quite fast enough, though. We'd reached the final stretch and could see Jim holding the door when the ominous sort of psychic pressure we'd been feeling suddenly ratcheted up. As the pressure mounted, Fumbles gibbered something like, It sees. It knows. It hungers. And then the entire corridor filled with a torrent downpour of blood. Everything slowed down to a crawl as the first drop of blood hit Sarge's face. Memories of two psychers in a cargo bay flittered through his mind and he slowly began to reach towards Fumbles. Then everything exploded. Well, there were actually two explosions. The first was sort of a psychic concussion. For a second, the rain of blood paused in midair. Then there was a crack of energy, and a wave of force radiated outwards from Fumbles. It was strongest at its epicenter, and all three of the pallet's human passengers were thrown off. Tank and the adepts both slammed into the corridor walls while Fumbles flew upwards, inexplicably stuck to the ceiling for a second, then flopped to the floor with an unpleasant splash. Behind the pallet, Sarge saw the wave coming and rather gallantly pushed Hannah behind him. This did not have the intended result. The wave hit Sarge and over a hundred kilos of physically propelled non slammed into Hannah. This in turn resulted in both of them tumbling backwards and landing in a heap. Unfortunately with Sarge on top, nearly crushing the poor cog girl. He probably would have died of embarrassment if it weren't for the fact that all five human projectiles were left unconscious by the blast. The final effect of the psychic concussion was to blow out all the lights in the corridor. Twitch, Nami, and Amy activated their shoulder-mounted lights and watched through the rain of blood as the pallet sloshed to a halt. The three of them held positions and kept their weapons trained on the Xanthrope until Jim shouted Hannah's name and began to run past them. Nubby casually stuck out a foot and tripped the panic cog boy, then followed Amy and Twitch as they began to move towards the pallet. Their cautious advance had nearly reached the pallet when the Xanthrope suddenly jerked into the air. It hung there for a second, like some sort of horrible giant puppet being held by tangled strings. Then a second explosion shook the entire ship. The world went green and Amy started screaming. 
It was a bit of a surprise to find ourselves alive after that. Moby and Twitch stood there in ankle-deep blood, shielding their eyes against the bright green light and watching Amy, who was screaming and wildly firing her pulse rifle at the Xanthrope's glowing energy shield. Guardsmen that they were, both of them quickly raised their own weapons and started firing as well. But after a few seconds, they noticed that something was weird. The Xanthrope wasn't fighting back. There were no lightning bolts or soul-rendering screeches, and on closer inspection, it didn't even appear to be awake. Of course, it wasn't until Theo came out to where he had been hiding in the cells and helped Jim to his feet and asked whether the plan was still to capture the Xanthrope alive. That's when they considered not shooting the Xenos. And everyone except Amy, who was too busy hysterically shooting at the Xanthrope to talk, put their heads together to figure out what to do. While the Xanthrope may not have been attacking, the psychic pressure had gone from ominous to outright painful, so the debate was a very short one. The second a halfway reasonable suggestion had been put forward, they all leapt into action, though Twitch and Nubby both bitterly complained that it was the non-human who made the plan. Well, plan is a grandiose term. They wanted to get the Xanthrope into the cell, but no one wanted to touch the sparking green shield. So, Theo had made the stereotypically Tau suggestion of using drones. He and Jim sent a small swarm of servo skulls and cudgeled together Tau drones behind the Xanthrope and had them start ramming its shields in an attempt to hurt it towards the door. Nubby and Twitch contributed by getting Amy to stop shooting and making sure no one was drowning in the warp blood. The plan was decent, but had a major problem. It was too slow. The skulls and drones didn't have that much push power to begin with, and the electrical nature of the Xanthrope shield was frying them out one by one. It was a race against the psychic pressure mounting to lethal levels, and we were losing. None of us had any ideas, though, as the thing probably would have gone poorly if Amy hadn't finally snapped out of her PTSD-inspired violent freakout. When Amy returned to coherence, she took one look at how slow it was going, cussed everyone out for being useless sissies, and seized the forgotten cargo pallet. She ran towards the Xanthrope, building as much speed as the blood allowed, and at the last second levered the pallet on two wheels and used it as a sort of poorly balanced battering ram. It worked surprisingly well. With Nubby and Twitch's help, another two blows got the Xanthrope to the door of the Psyker containment cell, where the problem of how to fit a 3 meter energy bubble through a 2 meter wide door presented itself. This was solved by the arrival of Sarge and Tink, who finally finished their naps and decided it was time to actually be useful. While Jim and Theo weren't quite as stubborn as us guardsmen argued over whether it was possible to widen the door without damaging something or other, we backed to the end of the corridor. We picked up the pallet like a more traditional battering ram. Sarge positioned himself at the back end and then we charged. Jim and Fio's debate was brought to a halt as a widely sparking Xenocyker shot between them, bounced off a few pieces of delicate machinery, and neatly slid into the waiting stasis unit. The techies slapped various on buttons, and then the terrible psychic pressure vanished. Out in the corridor, those of us who hadn't broken anything in the charge cheered, but our enthusiasm dwindled as every calm terminal in the cells began ringing. Jim checked the caller ID on one of the terminals, saw it was the captain, and decided it was our problem. Well, he said it was our problem, but everyone knew it was really Sarge's. Chain of command goes both ways and all that. So we hauled our two exhausted to be fearless leader off the ground, relocated his shoulder, and pushed him towards the nearest calm terminal. He stared at the thing, reproachfully for several seconds, swore a little bit just to make himself feel better, and then finally bit the bullet and grabbed the handset. All of us listened in as Sarge answered the call, both because we were curious and because the captain was yelling so loud that it was impossible for us not to. 
the man in charge of flying us through the void, who sounded both furious and terrified, had a few questions for us. Specifically, what in the Emperor's name had we done? Why was his navigator hysterical? Why his astropath was dead? And why two hive ships were headed towards us? Let me tell you, nothing ruins the taste of victory quite as thoroughly as hearing about how much collateral damage there was. Anyways, Sarge dealt with the captain by holding the handset out at arm's length and waiting for the man to run out of breath. When his chance came, Sarge told the captain he had the cargo secured, then promised to come up to the bridge. While he did that, the rest of us wearily speculated on just how screwed we were and collected our teammates from the blood-filled corridor. Fumbles was alive, but completely out of it, and there was something off about his eyes. You know, aside from being all rolled back. It was quickly decided that he needed a trip to the med bay, as did Hannah and the adept. Despite being in better shape than Fumbles, both of them were obviously in a fair amount of pain from their various dents and bruises. The less callous members of the squad felt a little guilty about that. Sometimes it's easy to forget that even the weediest guardsman is a great deal tougher than most folks. So, as I said, Sarge finished his call with a promise to come up to the bridge, which led to a near mutiny from the rest of us. That says something about our level of exhaustion that we found the prospect of another damned hike more distressing than the incoming hive ships. Since he was far too tired to force us all to come with him, and because there was some other stuff that needed doing anyways, Everyone but Amy, who turned out to be terrible at rock, paper, scissors, was excused from the trek. Nubby and Twitch were tasked with taking Fumbles, the Adup, and Hana to the med bay on the massively tented cargo pallet. Tink wanted to join the med bay group, both to get patched up and to retrieve Spot, but Jim and Fio needed his help with something technical sounding, so he had to stay. I wound up promising to save his drone from whatever horrible medical things were being done to it, and send it down with whoever was going to clean up the giant warp blood puddle. Sarge and Amy arrived on the bridge where they were surprised to discover that they were not the only ones covered with blood. The communications officer in front had a nice coating of red, with a few white and gray chunks mixed in. It turned out when the captain said the astropath was dead, he meant really dead. Anyways, the captain was up on his podium doing captainy things. When he saw Sarge and Amy, he paused from yelling at people and spared all of ten seconds to tell Sarge that now there were three hive ships incoming. He had absolutely no intention of letting them get into firing range, and we'd be leaving as soon as the warp drive finished warming up. After that, Sarge would explain just what the dirt suckers had done to the ship. As the captain went back to yelling at subordinates, Sarge digested the new information. After a few seconds, Amy realized he was stuck and performed the single duty she'd been brought along for, which is to say she jabbed Sarge in the ribs and reminded him to ask about the Space Marines. While Sarge stepped up to the podium with the captain, Amy, her important work completed, commandeered a comfy-looking chair from a terrified ensign. She fended off all attempts to removing her from a combination of obscenities, death threats, and some totally justified violence. The discussion on the podium quickly became an argument, albeit a quiet one. Sarge was not happy to hear that the Space Marine were not on board, or that the captain had no intentions on waiting for them. The captain was not happy with Sarge's complete lack of understanding when it came to the realities of naval warfare. Sarge made nearly a dozen suggestions as to how time could be bought. The captain, using the same sort of condescending tone we use when talking basic squad tactics to adepts and such, explained why every single one was either unwise, idiotic, or downright impossible. In the end, Sarge was forced to accept that unless the Space Marines made it back on their own, or at least started answering their Vox, 
they were going to be left behind. He dejectedly left the captain to do his business and wandered over to the brain-splattered communications officer. Out of a morbid sense of duty, and despite the fact that all of this information had already been broadcasted to the Space Marines, Sarge had the officer direct the Vox Array towards the highest ship that Rebus had boarded, and then began explaining the situation. This rather bleak message got no response, which indicated the Marines were still too close to the hive ship to break box silence, or as Amy unhelpfully suggested, that they were already dead. After a few minutes, Sarge's transmission dissolved into awkward apologies for abandoning the Space Marines to their deaths. Eventually, it grew so pathetic that Amy forced Sarge to hang up the box and stop embarrassing himself. The second, Ensign was evicted from his chair, and both of them sat and watched the Briz tactical display as the countdown to warp slowly continued. It was an incredibly depressing scene, but Sarge felt that he needed to stay until the end, and Amy was similarly bound to keep Sarge company. Sarge moped, and Amy flicked pieces of orc at the two tech priests on the bridge, and the captain captained and the rest of the bridge officers ran around doing stuff like redirecting void shields. Then the warp minus 60, everyone flinched as a psychic equivalent of millions of nails running down a massive chalkboard swept over them. Luckily the bridge windows had already been covered in preparation for entering the warp, so no one was driven insane by the sight of a massive hole in reality forming and sucking an entire tyrant hive ship not to mention a few thousand orc fighters, into the warp. In the confusion of prayers and curses that followed, Sarge noticed the Vox station chiming. Sarge nearly strangled the communications officer as he yanked the praying man off the floor and back into his seat. After a few seconds of button pressing from the officer and unhelpful yelling from Sarge, the Vox station spat out a piece of paper. Sarge snatched the paper and scanned the three lines of text on it. The only one that made sense was, Do not let us be forgotten, Sergeant Rebus. But that was enough for Sarge. He ran to the captain and thrust the paper into his hands. Sarge was halfway through triumphantly telling the captain that the marines were alive and probably just needed a small amount of time to dock when the captain shrugged and handed the paper back. Amy had to restrain Sarge as the captain told all hands to brace and began the final countdown to warp. Ten seconds later, the most violent warp transit either Sarge or Amy had experienced knocked them both to the ground. Over in the med bay, Twitch and Nubby had to hold down fumbles as he suffered a massive seizure, and Doc had the poor fortune of vomiting while wearing a surgical mask. Down in the psycho holding cell, Tink was knocked on his ass over a few overstressed pieces of equipment underwent rapid unplanned disassembly. As Jim hauled him back up, Theo poked his head around and asked if that had been a warp jump uh, because the psychic pressure of the hive mind wasn't decreasing. The ensuring argument over whether Theo actually knew how to read exterior psychic activity display was interrupted by a bolt of green lightning. Back on the bridge, the captain explained that the first two lines of the Space Marine's message had consisted of a astropathic contact code and an orbital vector. The codes would probably reach some Emperor-sized battle barge, and with the vector they'd be able to jump in and pick up their stranded battle brothers. They'd probably take a few months, but Marines were supposed to be very patient about those sort of things. Sarge accepted this without argument, mostly because he was too tired to get back up. Unfortunately, Sarge wasn't allowed to just go to sleep on the floor of the bridge. It wasn't like the captain or any of the other bridge officers objected. And after the explanation, he'd just been preoccupied with some unexpected hive ship shaped blips of the scanner. Instead, the problem was a very annoying voice on his combi. Tink, who was talking with the speed of someone who had just been dosed with stims, had a few questions of what the hell was going on. Sarge was forced to get up off the comfortable floor and explain that 
The big spike of warp energy had been the vortex bomb. No one had known the jump would be that bad, and the hive mind's continued presence probably had something to do with the remains of the vortex hive ship floating next to us in the warp. There was a bit of chatter in the background that sounded like, I told you, but Tink was too hyped up to actually listen to the answers. Halfway through Sarge's explanation, Tink started a high-speed tirade of how delicate and complex every piece of equipment in the cells was, how much that equipment had been damaged during the Xanthrope's imprisonment, and how important it was that he'd be told about these things before they happened. Tink's irate rambling was finally brought to a halt by the sound of a lightning bolt and some incredibly girly screaming in the background, followed by Jim ripping the con bead off Tink's head and screaming, The Xanthropes are weak! into it. According to Amy, Sarge didn't start crying when he realized the mission wasn't over yet, but it was a close thing. His despair didn't last long, though. Within a few seconds, he was barking a sit rep out to Tink and had Amy relay orders to the rest of us. In summary, the stasis unit was on the fritz. The warp presence shroud and exterior size shielding were being steadily torn apart by the hive mind's continued assaults, and the size suppressor was currently on fire, and the xanthrope was awake. The end result was that the captive Xenos was shooting half-strength lightning bolts every time the stasis field flickered, and everything was seconds away from spontaneously exploding. The situation was bad, but not quite as bad as Jim had made it sound. Tink was sure that he could fix everything. All he needed was old Bill, Hannah, uh, every available tech priest, a whole lot of parts, and quote-unquote, some idiots to stand in front of the lightning bolts, end quote, to be sent down to the psyche holding cells. Also Doc, or someone better at medicine than Doc, because Tink couldn't feel his legs anymore and Jim's fussy bits were a little crispy. Oh, and a uh, recaf. Lots and lots of recaf. It took a lot of yelling, a little bit of theft, not to mention at least two outright abductions, to put together a relief force. But we managed it. What was followed was an absolutely heroic repair effort by the techies plus a fair bit of general assistance from the rest of us. Which is to say that, in addition to playing gopher, we took turns holding a grounded boarding shield in front of the Xanthrope, and shooting the small demonic forms that occasionally rose out of the blood pool in the hallway. Finally, after several hours of frantic labor, and what we later informed was a similarly frantic retreat from the mangled but still living remains of the high ship, the occurrence border dropped back out of warp, and the situation in the cells stabilized. We declared victory and went the fuck to sleep. Now, I say declared victory, but that was more of a tactical sense than a strategic. We'd reached some sort of temporary calm spot, but all of us knew it wasn't going to last. We captured the Xanthrope and repaired its prison to a sort of minimal functional level, but we still had to haul it across an entire segmentum. That meant months of warp travel, which, given the notorious unworthiness of our ship, was quite dangerous even without the imprisoned Xenocyker. None of us were optimistic enough to think that we were going to make it through the whole thing without incident, and I won't even go into what the more pessimistic members of our squad predicted. Once we'd all gotten some much-needed sleep and medical treatment, a long and incredibly tedious post-mission meeting was held. All of us attended, but after the initial part where we regaled everyone with our heroic exploits, people started finding excuses to leave. These ranged from legitimate concerns about projects and patients to Nubby's dubious mumblings about having left a failed in the oven, to Amy just walking out. But eventually, everyone but Sarge and Jim escaped. In the end, it was just them, the captain, the adepts, a few ship officers planning out the whole mad voyage while the rest of us sloshed around in the med bay. Our continuous presence in the med bay wasn't really appreciated. 
The Hospitaller didn't really mind us, but her minions made several pointed comments about how nice it would be if some of us, specifically Nubby and Twitch, went back to our quarters. We ignored them though. It's not like we didn't appreciate our quarters, we just wanted to stick together and both Doc and Fumbles were more or less stuck in the medbay. Luckily, Doc wasn't stuck in the medbay because he'd been badly hurt. His girlfriend might have done horrible medical things to us if he'd been nearly crippled again. In fact, Doc was doing better than the rest of us were, primarily because he missed out on the whole shit show in the cells. Sergeant Gravis was in pretty bad shape though, and most of Doc's time was taken up with his treatment. While the bisected Space Marine condition had improved slightly when we've been moved to a much better and stocked and staffed medbay, that's only been temporary. There had been some sort of complex chemical war going between the Tyranid toxins and Gravis's weird Space Marine biology. Doc's girlfriend had hooked up a medical cogitator to some sort of socket in Gravis's power armor, and Doc was consistently either injecting or extracting fluids from the comatose Astartes based on what it said. It was remarkably unpleasant to watch, and the rest of us found it amazing how persistent Doc was about the whole thing. Honestly, the rest of us, including the Hospitaller, mind you, were in favor of just letting the Space Marine die after the second day of horrible medical torture, but Doc seemed committed to keeping Gravis alive as long as possible. We left him to it, both because it was far too gross to keep watching and because Fumble needed our company more than Doc. Fumbles was in the med bay for what you might call personal reasons. He'd come out of his psychic battle with the Xanthrope or hive mine or whatever different. Mentally, he was okay. I mean, he was still a bit neurotic and starved for praise as ever, and he still uncontrollably broadcasted his emotions to everyone nearby. But aside from that, and not remembering anything about the fight, he was fine. The problem was his eyes. At first, they just looked odd, and he was mostly blind, but over the next few days, we rested in normal space and they sort of grew and changed. Now, none of us wanted to use the M word, even if he was a psyker to begin with, but that was just the sort of stuff you're supposed to tell the Commissar about. I mean, his eyes got the size of a bloody fist. Well, maybe not Sarge's fist, but definitely one as big as Doc's girly hands. Anyways, that wasn't all. His pupils got all weird too. At their smallest, they were as wide as a young girl's finger, plus they sort of shined a bit. Man, they didn't always stay circular. It was creepy as all hell, let me tell you, especially because his eyelids didn't grow, so he couldn't even properly close his eyes. Creepiness aside though, the eye thing was amazingly unpleasant for Fumbles. For one thing, they didn't even fit in his head properly, and there was all sorts of painful pressure building up. Then there's the whole how sensitive they were. Anything but the dimmest light blinded the poor guy, and he couldn't even see that well in the dark since the skull pressure thing kept him from focusing. He wound up hiding away in the private treatment rooms, with the lights off and the windows shut, radiating misery. It was all we could do to take turns to try to make him feel better, and matters were not helped by the way of the hospitaler initial reactions to the situation. I mean, Doc's girlfriend didn't go all, Who's the unclean? But after it became obvious of what sort of shit was going on, she began studiously ignoring fumbles. That was especially rough on the little guy. You know, being all telepath and all that. Luckily, Doc stepped in and he got some help from our old diplomat adept too. They sat down with her and a few hours she came to Fumble's room muttering to herself about it being quote unquote just another wound suffered in the Emperor's service. Nubby and Twitch were initially distrustful of her change of heart but she let one of the more hygienic of the pair stay to observe and some medically approved skull cracking and eyelid stretching later Fumble's was feeling much better.
Anyways, we all hung out in the med bay while Sarge and his incredibly long meeting and quite sort of post-mission celebration. This primarily consisted of hanging out with Fumble's darkened room, a little drinking and sort of idle bullshitting that guardsmen revel in. Twitch sat next to Fumble's and gave him a blow-by-blow -blow of our mission with a lot of commentary of what really's going on added in. Fumbles mostly nodded and played with a pair of welding goggles Nubby had acquired for him from somewhere. They were going to need some resizing before he can wear them, but after that he'd be able to leave the room, and wouldn't look any weirder than the rest of us. Doc, who was on break from Gravis watching, and Amy speculated on what Sergeant Rebus and his scouts were doing to pass the time. Doc's idea were all about hibernation and other boring medical stuff. Amy mocked him for his lack of imagination. Her suggestions were definitely more imaginative, boarding on the heretical even, and Doc hastily changed the subject. Unfortunately, he did this by congratulating her on a whole mission without a facial burn, and on the regrowth of her hair. He managed to duck the bottle she threw at him. Nubby and Tink started talking about the various ways they'd come out ahead on the mission. By their reckoning, they were up a few grav chutes, a power sword, a bolter, and a whole collection of space marine toys, not to mention a moderately damaged stealth shuttle that was still waiting for us to get around to repairing it. Tink was beginning to speculate on whether Gravis really needed the bottom half of his power armor and what he could make out of it if he had the time when Sarge finally returned from his planning session. After automatically flipping on the lights, blinding bubbles, and then hastily turning the Mac off, Sarge grabbed a seat and told Tink to stop contemplating tech heresy. All of us watched him as he grabbed a bottle, leaned back, and eyed Tink a little more. In an idle sort of way, Sarge asked us a purely hypothetical question. If Jim had been in the meeting with him, old Bill and Hanna were busy keeping the ship running, and Tink was here, then who was down in the cells keeping everything running and watching the Xanthrope? The only answer he could think of was Theo, which couldn't possibly be right. It'd be a colossally idiotic to leave one of our Xeno prisoners alone and unsupervised in charge of keeping the other Xeno's prisoner from escaping and killing us all. Surely there must be some other explanation, one which he was too dumb to think of, right? Tink pondered that for a second, then scrambled for the door. Sarge wearily laughed and told him to sit back down. Once Tink was seated, Sarge looked at each of us and gave us the lowdown. As we knew, the Psyker holding cells were falling apart, Xanthrope was doing bad things every time the stasis field flickered, and Sergeant Gravis was at death's door, and our ship's astropath had suffered a severe case of exploding head. We had no choice but to get back into the warp, but we we're going to head to the nearest civilized Imperial world first. From there, we could order some replacement parts, get a new astropath, call for the Marines pickup, and hand Gravis over to someone with serious medical facilities. It was going to be rough, and we had to stand constant guard against warp shenanigans, but luckily, it would only take a week. Just one week of frantic jury rigging, dealing with whatever the Xanthrope and the warp could throw at us, and keeping Gravis from melting. Then it would be all over. Honestly, looking back, I have no idea why any of us believed it was going to be that easy.